we have a live guest today, uh, a very special live guest. He has directed a couple episodes of Game of Thrones, including uh, one of my favorite episodes of all time where dragons just absolutely roast the entire Lannister army. Uh, he's worked on The Boys, <laughs> in the Billions, It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. He even showed his face in The Ten of Us. But he is best known to us now. He is beloved by us for directing WandaVision. Mr. Matt Shackman is live on Phase Zero. Great to be here. Oh, thank you for joining us, Matt. And congratulations on the show, man. I mean, like, it, it was so good and seeing everybody talk about it. And we've had so much fun talking about it. I imagine that can only be fun for you. Oh, yeah. I mean, this was the best job in the world. We had so much fun making it. And I can't tell you how great it is that people love the show uh, as much as we loved making it. Yeah, I watched that. Uh, I watched Assembled this morning uh, at like nine in the morning, and uh, that's how I started my day. And it looks like you guys had a blast. I hope everything releases something like that. But it was fun to see you guys get to work together and just talk about each other and, and watch what went into it. That was cool. Yeah, no, it made me misty when I got to see it too. When they showed me the cut to see all my friends and colleagues talking about what they did on the show and seeing the behind the scenes footage. Because when you're making it, you don't even think about those cameras off to the side. You're so busy doing it, and then to be able to watch it come together uh, is great for me too. It's really fun. Yeah, that's awesome. I think it's it's interesting that uh, it, you make a comment in um, during it where how this this show was basically uh, all the best pieces of things that you love to do in in one show. So now that you have done that, how can you do anything else? <laughs> exactly, which is why I'm retiring. I'm announcing it here, guys. I'm done. I'm hanging it. <laughs> <laughs> no. No, I think well, uh, I, I feel like has to go to college, so no, I can't hang it up. <laughs> <laughs> no, I told you when we talked the other day, I firmly believe the best is still to come for you, man. You've just been growing and growing and taking on these bigger and bigger projects and just knocking them out of the park. So I'm excited to watch your journey. Awesome. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Yeah, we'll see what's um, up. I have no idea what's next. <laughs> well, listen, so we gotta talk about we gotta talk about the most recent project, WandaVision. That's why you're here. Absolutely. So we rounded up uh, we rounded up some questions from fans. We're going to roll in some questions from fans in a little bit. But first, I want to go kind of character by character with you on on some on some of the journeys we saw and some of your work. And I mean, this show is it's Wanda's show. And, you know, Vision is is I would say had to be second on the call sheet. But to me, this is Elizabeth Olsen. This is Wanda Maximoff, her journey, her growth. And finally, we really get to know her. And I feel like this was best summarized in the, in the fact that the best line of the show, maybe of the entire MCU was when vision said, but what is grief if not love persevering? But when he said that while they're both in the frame, the camera was aimed at Wanda. I want to hear about that choice. Like, you know why we're focused on Wanda when the best line of the entire Marvel cinematic universe is delivered. Why? <laughs> Cause she's the one who needs to hear it the most. Um, and we need to see her hear it because that's when she falls in love with Vision, you know? When she realizes what kind of connection they have and the kind of solace that he offers her and the understanding that he has about her in particular. And so she delivers, I mean, Lizzie's amazing and she delivers that, um, that bit of dialogue before that famous line, which I also think is heartbreaking about feeling like you're gonna drown in grief. Um, so we needed to be on her for that, which is one of the longest shots in the show. I mean, it's just a very slow pushing on her. She delivers this um, extraordinary line in an extraordinary way. Um, and then we cut back to Paul and then we cut back to her to see what the, you know, sort of how that line from Paul lands on her. Um, that whole scene is about their connection forming and um, the beginning of what will be a great love story. Did you ever think about throwing a first kiss in there? Yeah. <laughs> no, but we did add that little bit when we were we were shooting it, you know, that kind of just looking at each other and kind of just missing each other's look, which is very like teenagers, uh, you know, in, in the car at the drive-in movie. Um, and it, that's very touching. You know, we're just seeing the beginning of something. Um, if it was the first kiss, that would be too big a moment in a way. Like, you know, we were in those 
flashback yeah. ep- uh, scenes from that episode, it really was about finding those little quiet moments that might otherwise not have been a major scene in a film, but it's really important to their story, the intimacy, their relationship. And so it is the beginning of something, but it's not the big, you know, right, first, right, right. This no, I, I, yeah, I right. just wanted to, I just wanted to compliment that choice though, to have to, to show us uh, Wanda's face in that moment. Cause it, uh, this was about her and it was great to see her react to that line. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Matt, was it, uh, you know, Elizabeth Olsen puts on such a nuanced performance, right? When she's jumping back and forth between, uh, you know, being in the the sitcom world and then like those moments when reality starts to hit and, and creep in, you know, is, is directing, is directing that, you know, it feels like it's harder than than it looks. I mean, you guys made it come off kind of so so seamless. But can you, can you talk a bit about that process and how like that shell begins to crack and what it's like for you um, to kind of direct those moments? Well, first off, she is an extraordinary actress, you know, and so it, it is so much fun to work with her because she brings all this amazing preparation as well as huge instinct. I mean, I think what's so special about her, but it's true about Paul, it's true about Tiana, it's true about Catherine Hahn, kind of everybody in the show, is that they work so hard before they show up there, but then they're completely able to give in to the moment, right? They're they're able to take what they're getting from the other actor, or come up with choices they might not have planned at home. And so it's that perfect mix of like knowing where you're coming from, the things you kind of want to accomplish in that scene, but then being open to that extraordinary performer across from you who's giving you so much. And so, and then for me as a director, yeah, I prepare the same way, but we're all playing jazz together, right? So mm-hmm. I, I have prepared, I know what I want to get out of a scene. I know what the key moments are and the turns and the rhythm and all of that, that I'm trying to get out of it, which by the way, we're always in line you know, together because they're such smart storytellers that we all are kind of working at the, on the same sort of goal, you know, but then as I see things happening, will go deeper in certain ways. There'll be little discoveries that are happening. Um, moments that maybe we thought would work really well are not. And, you know, it's my job to sort of be like, oh, wow, that's not quite working the way we thought it would, which is, you know, sometimes brilliant lines on the page don't quite work when it's happening in space. So then you make little trims, you make little cuts, you, you huddle around the monitor and say, oh, maybe we should say it this way. And so it's it's all a big process of sort of discovery as you go. That's what I love about it. I mean, I, I do a lot of theater, which I love too. Theater is a very long process. You know, you have mm-hmm. rehearsal and tech rehearsals, and then you open, you have previews, and you see how the audience likes it, and you, you have opening night. And um, in in this kind of project, you have all those steps in about 10 minutes, right? You have your first rehearsals, you huddle around, you stage it, you block it, do all the tech stuff, get the camera stuff, lighting, and then you do it and then it's gone. You know, it's and you'll never go back to it. Um, so it's really fun. It's a lot of high energy um, and it's about just everybody trying to be in sync and being as focused and present in the moment as you possibly can be. I want to hear about the design of of uh, Wanda Scarlet Witch full costume because this is a this is such a moment that Marvel fans have been waiting for since we met her and we thought maybe like Civil War was as close as we were going to get or Infinity War was then as close as we were going to get and now we got the whole headpiece everything like what what went into also it, the sideshow version has a cape was that ever something you guys considered Yeah so we worked really hard on that it was almost one of the first things we began you know when I when I started on the show I began working really closely with Andy Park and the visual development department at Marvel, which is a group of incredibly talented people who've designed all of your favorite outfits over the last decade. And so I, I was working with 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 Andy and and going through different versions of that and also of White Vision and also of Agatha, all the sort of big hero looks that we needed to establish in the show. I and mean, she's been Wanda Maximoff in the MCU up to this point, right? So she hasn't, she wouldn't be wearing that outfit because they haven't named her yet. She hasn't embraced that destiny. She hasn't been set on that road yet. Um, so we've seen her in versions of it that evoked it. Um, and I know there were early discussions a long time ago when they were doing Ultron about whether they wanted to go in the sort of comic book direction, but they decided, no, this is this is a story about um, Wanda and Pietro who have been experimented on, who knows the sort of, uh, the depth of their powers and how they got them exactly. Our show was about exploring how she became the Scarlet Witch. You know, it was about um, dealing with the past and loss and grief 
and it was about her destiny and the future, right? So that's what the show is about. And we knew we were building towards that moment of her becoming. So we, yeah, we, we obviously love the comics. We have gone through every possible issue featuring um, the Scarlet Witch and Vision, as you probably can imagine. Um, and you see the classic comic one in our Halloween episode six. So we do pay uh, homage to sort of the, uh, the classic Scarlet Witch look. But we wanted to find out what is that contemporary version of that? And we enjoyed that you were gonna get to see both in a way. Um, and we started, I, I will admit, with a very tiny, slender crown because, you know, we're like, oh, the crown, it's big, it's huge, it's so big, will people be able to take it? You know, and then we just kept making it bigger because that's who she is, right? So in the end, you know, it became a much more impressive, cool, um, proper sized crown. Um, and because we were seeing it develop first magically, um, that was gave us permission in a way. You know, you see it uh, on Evanora, who is um, Agatha Harkness's mother in the, the, in the Salem witch trial scene at the beginning of episode eight. You see that she has a crown too, that this is something that happens when you're sort of the head witch, when you have all the power and when, it, and you, when you're deciding to use it, right? So we established it there. And then you see it in that kind of nightmare forest version of it where it appears on Wanda's head first magically. And then because she's the master of chaos magic, she makes things real. Like that's what chaos magic is, right? It's, it's not illusion. It's the ability to create things whole cloth. And that's what makes her more powerful than the Sorcerer Supreme, right? That's what makes her this incredibly powerful um, magical creature in the MCU, right? So she turns her magical crown solid, you know, and that's kind of what happens uh, in her becoming moment there. Doctor Strange I, is about to have his hands full. <laughs> well, I, I, actually, it's, it's, it's funny. It's great that you bring that up because I have a question about the magic, um, you know, kind of of it all. Right. So, um, you know, one of the things that we that we all as, you know, as a group kind of talked about throughout the season was um, the the colors of magic. I know, you know, you've kind of mentioned, um, you know, uh, you know, why Agatha's is, is purple or whatnot. But is there like do is there a Bible somewhere that like you guys put together that kind of defines the difference between, you know, a witch uh, versus a sorcerer and, you know, cause like Billy's magic was blue. And so does that, like, what does that tie to, you know, you know, Agatha's uh, the kind of magic that Agatha's uh, mom was using versus, you know, what Agatha had, like, is that all kind of there or was it more just, are they truly just kind of more visual cues than anything else? It's a little bit of both. I mean, I will say that we went through a lot of exploration about magic. Um, for a long time, we were talking about should should Agatha even be blasting, right? Should should her magic be elemental? Should it be you know uh, a storm of of dirt and cicadas and tree branches and like you know is there a way to sort of define? ancient witch versus modern scarlet witch. You know? So we went down that path for a long time um, and ultimately decided that it, it didn't feel um, as rooted to the character. And also as we started to develop that um, uh, you know, flashback to Salem where we knew that the blasting would be so important, we, we said, no, this is, this is who Wanda has been. And this is who, and she's always been a witch, she just didn't know it. So let's continue to work within the sort of color space of, of, of blasting, energy blasting. Um, and then, so that's that's all storytelling there, which is important. And then, yeah, it is color coding storytelling is important because you don't, there's there's a lot going on in the MCU and um, there are only so many colors, right? So there is definitely <laughs> a the color wheel, right? Where you're like, so and so has that color and Wanda's got this red and, um, and purple, of course, is Agatha's color in the comics. And so we always knew we wanted it to be purple. That's that's mm -hmm. just who she is. And, and Billy's colors in the comics are, are blue as well. So we knew that we wanted to go there. So we're, we're honoring Wiccan. Um, we're honoring Agatha Harkness as they have existed in the comic you know, book tradition thus far. But then beyond that, there are simple directorial needs of we need to see that Agatha Harkness can steal magic from other witches. So her purple has to eat away at that blue. They have to be different. I mean, there was a time when we said that maybe every witch has their own individual um, uh, color. So there, there, that we explored that coven scene with a million different colors coming at her. And it really felt like a, a an acid trip, you know, from the 70s. It was just like, <laughs> this is crazy. What am I looking at? Um, and so Tara DeMarco, who's the visual effects supervisor, and I were just like, hmm, we need to rethink this. So we thought simple is always better, which is, I think, one of the great lessons that I've learned from Kevin Feige, who's a master of the most complicated mythology, is always there to remind you, like, you have enough. Like, it's already, you've got enough there. Like, you can simplify this moment you can and it will still be huge um and that is true so then we were just like let's go blue light blue all around which is a different blue than billy's 
blue later. Um, if you're paying attention to the color wheel, if you care about <laughs> such things. Um, and then, um, and then it was, it, we were able to tell that story. So yeah, everybody has their own sort of their, their own color really. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the 70s, so I got to bring up uh, my favorite thing about the show, which is the sitcom aspect of it all. I, I'm just so obsessed with with that. Uh, and, but I'm dying to know, you guys kind of skipped over the 90s. Um, you From the 80s right to Malcolm in the Middle, which was 2000. Um, was there a reason for that? Is it does, Do the 90s not speak to Wanda? <laughs> You know, I saw a lot of people, a lot of people commenting on that. Well, we sort of really didn't. I mean, we played a little fast and loose because, you know, we called the Dick Van Dyke inspired era the 50s. But Dick Van Dyke was really very late 50s. They were developing the show and it came out. It was really more early 60s. So we were playing kind of fast and loose with that, which was the same for Malcolm. Malcolm was developed in the late 90s. Its pilot was shot in the late 90s. It established itself, obviously, in the early aughts as an important show. But, so we were playing with that sort of generational divide. But really for us, it was that you know, when you're talking about the 80s, whether it's you know early 80s to late 80s, um, into that overlap into the early 90s, you're kind of in the same show. Right, family ties, full house, growing pains. They're all they're all the same level of emotionality. They're full of important special episodes where lessons are being taught, you know, and so that was what we were doing within that episode five, right? You know, where mom is, is having important conversations about death with and you know, with the kids, and we were following that trope. And so to do another episode that would have said maybe like full house or something, you were just kind of swimming around within the same tropes and styles anyway. Jumping to Malcolm, of course, is a very big difference because all of a sudden the laugh track is gone and wacky music takes over to tell you when things are funny, you know, and the style becomes more subjective. The camera is all of a sudden part of the comedic storytelling. And so it was a way for us to just boldly change up the plan because that's what Wanda wants to do, right? She's had this huge fight with Vision. Suddenly there's this special visitor at the door who she wants desperately to believe is her brother. And then when, you know, when things pressure Wanda, she changes the style, right? That's why things mm -hmm. shift. And mm -hmm. so she moves it to something a little bit more wacky, you know, to kind of uh, to process yeah. what's next. That makes a lot of Jamie, sense. Jamie, are you, do you accept? Do you I accept. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I do want to, everybody, I see the comments. A lot of people in the comment section on Twitch right now, using the want, want justice for Quicksilver. We're going to talk about Quicksilver, but I do have a question for everybody who is commenting that. Where were you all two months ago? I didn't hear anybody <laughs> talking about Quicksilver two months ago. So <laughs> we're going to get to the Pietro stuff, but but I do have a question for you all. And also on that note, follow our channel. Uh, and now I want to talk about Vision. Uh, and actually, Jamie Jamie has a good question about Vision because, and I'm also very interested in this as like my inner my inner film nerd, like who just loves the how these things are made. But Jamie brought up something interesting. We were talking about this. Yeah, I, I imagine. What sort of challenges did you face for the Vision versus Vision action scenes? I'm sure that that was a difficult thing to to shoot with two Paul Bettany's. <laughs> Yeah, well, one Paul Bettany is, is wonderful. Two Paul Bettany's is extraordinary. So I'm not even complaining at all. He is one of my very favorite people. He is just such a brilliant actor, but also just the funniest person. And I know that he trolled some Marvel fans a little bit by talking about the great actor he got to work opposite, which when I saw that interview come out, I just laughed so hard. I was like, oh, no. Uh, but, you know, he is, he's hilarious. And that is him. He is, he is that. Um, guy, um, but you know he he worked his his butt off to to bring this um, to life, and he, you know, it's a lot of hard work um, being in that suit and all that makeup and to deliver the performances that he delivers. I mean, that's a lot. And then we were shooting when it was 120 degrees, when the fires were happening in California, the air quality was borderline. We had to shut down several days because he just couldn't breathe. And then there's a pandemic on top of all of that, and but he is just dripping in sweat. I mean, some days, you know, his bald cap would come off just because of the sweat was so much. And yet he's 100% focused, you know, it's he's that kind of performer. Um, even when he's flying up in the air and uncomfortable harnesses add the, add the heat as well. It's amazing. But he has um, an extraordinary um, stunt double named Adam, who does a lot of great physical work on his behalf. But also when we were gonna shoot the library, I, I quickly went up to him early and said, would you mind, I really need you to approach this as an actor to learn these lines, both sets of lines as well as you can and be the best screen partner you can be to Paul because he's gonna have to shoot opposite you. And, and we had them in, in you know, one, one, one was white, the other was red. And, uh, and Adam did a brilliant job and, and, and gave 
uh, you know, a great performance at, performance opposite Paul. So yeah, so half the time he'd be red, then we'd swap it and we'd have to redo everything with him in the other color. It was a real sort of complicated Rubik's cube of scheduling to kind of work it all out, which Janelle, the first AD, did a brilliant job of doing. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it, it has its challenges for sure. Dude, when I saw on the assembled thing this morning that there was actually two people dressed as white vision and regular vision, I I didn't real I thought you guys just must have CGI'd that in. I, that blew my <laughs> I was like, yeah, they really had like Paul opposite somebody dressed as white vision. That was cool. I didn't having somebody learn the lines. That's some cool dedication. Yeah, uh, I mean, it's kind of the approach to the the Winkle Buy and Social Network, which Fincher did, you know, the Army Hammer. There was another actor who worked with him and they would do the scenes as with both twins there. And then sometimes they'd repeat it and Army would switch to be the other one. And sometimes they use face replacement. And that's basically what we did too. You know, some of the wide shots are face replacement and then some of them we actually shot Paul twice so that we could pop them in. Uh, that's, that's impressive. Uh, I love the magic show, especially I've specifically ordered all 12 issues of the vision and Scarlet Witch, like a couple months before the show came out so I could read them. I'm a big physical copy guy and the glamor and illusion reference. I felt like I was the only person catching that because it was so fresh in my mind. I thought it was so cool. And then people started to catch on and appreciated it. Uh, but the magic show of it all, which we now know Agatha was behind, uh, but like what kind of like moving the piano and like having Paul float, we got a little peek at that during the show. Was there anything of that that was particularly difficult from a production standpoint to to do? Or was it a little bit more fun because you could kind of have like the MacGuffin of it all incorporated? It was a real challenge. It was also super fun. We, but it, it was almost more complicated than all those visions fighting each other um, because it's an old school play that involves a ton of illusion. Um, you, and you, it's long, there's a lot of tricks in there and there's a lot on Paul and Lizzie, especially Paul, who's doing this amazing drunk act the whole time too. And we have a whole crowd of people watching it. So you have all these wonderful actors from the town watching this. So it was, a, it was, you know, it was difficult to shoot. It took days and days and days and you could only go up to a, a gag and then you'd have to stop because then you have to get in the harness and he has to be able to fly. And then you have to, you know, the, the piano is brought in, the real one and the fake one is brought in that's two dimensional. And so it was just a game of inches. You know, you could really couldn't, it, it appears like it's one beautiful act from beginning to end, but it is an, an endless stop and go with gags. Um, and then hope that the acting, you know, could survive uh, as feeling like it isn't stop and go, which is to a testament to Paul's genius that he's able to make it feel like it flows, even though it most definitely was not. But he I was I so it. good in that. Yeah, he was Amazing. so good. Yeah, he was so good in that scene. Yeah, and he never knew he was that funny. Like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, he, oh, he's so funny, but like hitting the hitting the the post and apologizing to it. They, those are yeah. all things he was just adding, you know, that weren't in the wow. script. Um, oh. He's 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 a very imaginative guy. And then we sort of, and there was always a card trick with Herb, but that whole moment is really wonderful. David Payton, who plays Herb, I think is just brilliant. And um, the two of them have such great chemistry that um, uh, that moment where the pick a card, pick a card, is this your card? Um, that ended up getting sort of embellished and extended. And uh, there's a lot of improv in that too. And it's one of my favorite moments. Yeah, that was one of my favorite scenes from the whole show. I know Jim has one question he has been he has been <laughs> pining for for months and months. He has become known on the internet as the the person who wants to see this the most. Jim, Jim, just finally get your answer. I'm gonna I'm gonna preface this with the fact that it did not happen does not take away any of my enjoyment of the show. I have loved the show, but <laughs> the thing I was waiting for the app the the most he had to take was, a sip of water <laughs> to get ready. He's, <laughs> it's just it, like look, it, it the the one the one like sitcom-y kind of gag that I was kind of hoping for was a visit from the in laws and like a, an in law that would have been so great to see would have been James Spader as Ultron. <laughs> did that even? cross your mind is, is the only thing I need to know as a thing to potentially try and do. Um, that is a very funny idea. Um, thank you for the suggestion. Uh, <laughs> and gentlemen, too, for now. Um, you know, I will say the James Spader of it all, uh, someone added him to IMDb as being in our cast. And, and then that becomes fact, you know, it's like alternate okay. facts. Like someone just put that there and then it was just, we know that Spader is in the show. Like when he's coming, it's like <laughs> he's not in the show. He's never been in the show. Um, and uh, that was Jim. Jim, Jim definitely did that. <laughs> that was definitely well, Jim. Yes, nice. I mean, Ultron is a, is a huge part of their past, but um, again, it didn't feel like you know we're already bringing back one dead robot. 
Um, how many can you bring back? Um, so uh, uh, it's a very funny idea and it absolutely is a trope, but you know, we, there were only so many we could use. So we went with the boss, bringing the boss home for dinner. That's great. I wanted, I wanted to see in the, the office themed uh, episode, the, the, I wanted to see Robert California walk in and just, <laughs> <laughs> and just take over uh, computational services. Now let's, let's talk about Monica a bit. Uh, I, I think I read somewhere, I think it was you that said she was, she was originally had a bigger role in the final fight. And then it just became, we want to, we want this to be more Agatha and Wanda centric and vision, vision centric. Is that true? What, like, or what, was that you that said that? Am I making that up? I, I said something that, that isn't that, but may have been interpreted as that. So I'll clarify the record, which is that she was never playing a big role in Wanda Agatha. We always wanted that to be Wanda and Agatha. And she was not playing a part in the visions. It was, it was one of our things we wanted to introduce her powers, suggest them, but not go whole hog with them. There's still a lot of discovery that she has as a character about what she can do. And um, she's not in control of them yet. She's she's it, so that's why we wanted always to have a power moment be almost like an unconscious thing. Um, the way she goes in there as a hero just to save those kids. She's literally throwing her body in the way of those bullets. Um, and the fact that she then can uh, manipulate her body to be the same wavelength as those bullets and and they pass through her harmlessly and slow down. That's a huge discovery for her. Um, it's not we, we did not want to try to. Um, uh, you know, accelerate her into full Avenger uh, by the end of that episode. So we didn't, there was never a plan for her to to be sort of partnering with Wanda to defeat Agatha. Um, but we did have a whole other set piece that I, that I talked to Kevin Smith about, which was, which was a, a set piece with Monica and the kids, Darcy and Ralph in the basement, the magical Agatha basement, when they're trying to get the dark hold, which was something we had early on that we shot actually, but ended up uh, not using because it was just super long. <laughs> it was its own uh, one act play, which I loved, but that did not fit with the balancing. Because when you're doing a finale and you've got all these different players on the chessboard and it's all concurrent storytelling, you can't leave Wanda in the town square for. 10 minutes to go do something else because you come back and you either have to have jumped ahead to something completely different, which isn't fair to Wanda in the finale, um, or it feels like you pop time, which doesn't make a lot of sense yeah. either. So you, you got to be careful with how much of that reveal because before you know it, hashtag release the Shackman cut is is the next big movement. <laughs> <laughs> release the Shackman cut all over Twitter. Disney won't be you able to send the tweet. Cut. Yeah. <laughs> you saw it's it. Squash it right there. It exists. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, for Monica, um, were you given any details about her journey in Captain Marvel 2? Like, did they tell you, you know, you you need to give her the powers in this moment or anything like that? No, I mean, that's what is so great, I think, about, about Marvel and about the way Kevin runs things. He, he's so focused on this story now and doing the best thing for this story now and then passing the baton to the next group of filmmakers. So in our case, we had um, we had the inside scoop in a way because our producer, Mary Lovanos, is also the producer of Captain Marvel 2. So, she, you know, we were doing Wanda and trying to sort of work out all the legit, all the sort of final moves in the Wanda story before she had actually even gotten that deep into writing Captain Marvel 2. So a lot of the stuff that we're doing in Wanda and sort of locking in for Wanda informs how they build the story going from there. So it's not a, it, it's very organic. It's not a, a, a thing of like, we have to hit this moment and this moment and this moment, which I think a lot of people think about when they think about the sort of jigsaw puzzle that is the MCU, but it is, it's well thought out, of course, on a, on a, on a big picture, but it, it allows for this organic storytelling so that you can hand off things in a, in a wonderful way to the next group of filmmakers who then take them. So um, it was like, it was like this on Game of Thrones too. We always have this rule that like, if you're, if you're the first to introduce a character, or introduce a set or whatever, even if maybe a, a different director had a huge set piece later on in that thing, if you're there first, you get to move the furniture around and figure out how you want that character to be introduced, figure out you know how that character looks and sounds and all that, um, and then you hand it off to the next person. So even though Monica will have a, a giant role to play in the few she was um, launched here and we got the chance to sort of figure out how that should work um, in close consultation with Tiana, who's also much like Lizzie and Paul, brilliant and hardworking and thoughtful. And um, we partnered together to, to try to bring this amazing, powerful person to life, you know, um, so yeah. that was fun. Tiana did such a good job with it. I'm not going to lie. 
I don't fully believe you guys when you say this stuff. Uh, I think you know more about Captain Marvel 2 than you want to tell us, but I, I respect it. I know how it goes. <laughs> I know how it goes. But uh, no, I, I think it is cool. I, I hear You hear so many stories of, of directors and writers who join franchises, and it seems like they're creatively, even just a little bit stifled. But you guys at Marvel, it seems like you really do get to do your thing. And I, 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 have, I think that's awesome. I think that's really cool. Uh, so, uh, oh, I thought we were about to take a break. I just read the chat. We are... Not going to take a break. We'll just throw it in for the podcast. Uh, let's bring up one of our. We have. We're going to dive into some theories, but first, like addressing some of the theories, some of the stuff that uh, fans and myself. Every Friday, you guys see me out here making a fool of myself. Uh, <laughs> they, they reshot this show every week just so that we were wrong. It's amazing. <laughs> the, the budget must have been unbelievable. But uh, I, I want to tee up one of the fan questions, Richard. Uh, whichever one comes first, let's hear. Let's hear from one of the, the Phase Zero Ultimate fans. Hello, Matt Shockman and Fazio Podcast. I'm a huge fan of you both. So my quick question is, at the end of the final battle, Wanda puts the effect on Agatha to always make her Agnes, you know, that sort of curse on her. So when the Hex gets disbanded, is that so-called curse still on Agatha to make her Agnes, even though the Hex is gone? That's a great question. And the answer is yes, yes. Um, Agatha remains Agnes um, in the sitcom trapped in the sitcom reality um, until someone maybe needs to come find her again. We'll see. That's a, I like that question. Let's do another one. Let's do one more. Richard, uh, do we have do we have question number two Going ready? On the Phase Zero podcast. So my question for Matt is, how did using older equipment on the set of WandaVision change the entire process of filmmaking for the show as a whole? I've been wondering this for a long time, and I can't wait for your response. That's a great question. Obviously, we wanted to bring these worlds to life authentically. So we used old lenses, we used old lighting. And also, as you see in episode eight, when you finally get a chance to see how that hex was built and how she created vision, we actually then break the fourth wall and you see that world, you see the lighting instruments, you actually see what we used to shoot it. Um, not the cameras, there's some old fashioned cameras in there. We used modern cameras, um, but this was Wanda's reality that she had created and she is capable of creating things whole cloth because of chaos magic and she's the only person who has this power so the pressure i felt was to live up to what wanda maximoff would have created which is she would have created something perfect so every detail had to be perfect you know down to whatever's in her refrigerator and she doesn't want anyone in westview to be thinking about anything outside of westview so every product is a westview product the newspaper is only advertising headlines about new fire hydrants on Main Street. Like there is nothing outside this world um, except what's happening here. So um, we used we used a, a, the Alexa camera, which is a workhorse and a beautiful camera. We weren't trying to shoot on film. Um, it just would have been too difficult because we were going back and forth into so many different modes and styles and periods. Uh, but we did try to specifically carve out lens packages for every single era. And then when we were shooting Marvel, we were using the Avengers uh, Endgame set of lenses. And so we were we were very much trying to continue that tradition because we were picking up directly from them. Um, and then when we were trying to recreate Bewitched and Brady Bunch style shows, we wanted to make sure that we were being accurate to each era in terms of lighting instruments and lenses. Nice. It's very cool. I find that stuff very interesting. And also, I want to shout out Arian for that question. Uh, I think it makes a lot of sense that he was asking that question while his camera was so crystal clear, by the way. I think that was pretty cool. That was probably the most perfectly uh, focused question we're going to have in terms of camera submission. Now, I have a, I have a few more questions I want to ask. Uh, and I think we all have some that we want to throw at you. We have some more fan questions we're going to get to in just a second. And if you're, talk, if you're, if you're on Twitch, drop some questions in the comments. We'll try to get some of those if we have time here. Uh, but I, I am curious... Because we come out here every Friday, we talk about this, and all weekend long, it's theories and it's Twitter trends, and some of it turns out to be accurate, some of it turns out to be inaccurate. But like when the internet goes crazy like that, I, I like to imagine there's a group text where it's like you and Elizabeth and Paul, and then Kevin Feige is there, and he never responds, but he's there. And just everybody from the show, Jack is there. He, al he always leaves everyone on red is how I, how <laughs> yeah, I, I imagine he just never, he's just like, I'm not touching this. You guys, you know, the drill, <laughs> but, so, but, but like, what do you guys talk to each other about? Like, is there like a, 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 a line of communication where you're like, did you guys see this one? Did you guys, do you guys send each other TikToks and all the memes and stuff like that? 
Yeah, we Please did. We passed, them, we passed them around. They're good. You got to pass them around. Yeah, yeah. We, I would get them at all hours of the night. And we'd pass them around. And we'd laugh, and I'd, I'd get them from all the you know Victoria Alonso at Marvel would send me. Said, did you see this one? With you know, I got one from her the other day when they redid uh, um, Vision and uh, and uh, Wanda in place of Meghan Markle and Harry oh. being interviewed by Oprah. That was a good one. Um, which is super popular. I mean, there's there've been there have been so many wonderful creative ones. Um and uh and yeah, we, we definitely pass them all around. And Kevin's a part of that too. And he's not silent. He is absolutely <laughs> he is, he is a good I'm not gonna lie. I interviewed Kevin before the show debuted. I had seen the three episodes, but when we started the interview, it's become like an online joke that I'm like, I want to play Nova. Nova's my favorite hero. Put me in the MCU. He started the interview by saying, Brandon, remember, this is an interview and not an audition to play Nova. And I was just like, you read my tweets. You, 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 this guy awesome. was, I hate that. <laughs> he is the true superhero. He really He's is. I, mean, I, I think know. it's, yeah. It, but uh, it was a it. shocking moment of realization that some of the stuff we stay here is actually heard by you guys. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I mean, <laughs> Case in point, the aerospace engineer conversation that never stopped, even after we met the aerospace engineer people, I mean, myself included, I'm guilty of it. I was like, maybe there is somebody still coming. Maybe this is a surprise. John Krasinski was trending on Twitter, like as a result of this. And he, did, did John Krasinski call you and be like, yo, what, what, what is going? Like, how does that, why didn't he say anything? Like, I'm so curious. <laughs> what is there, like when that kind of thing happens, like are you guys like, did you see this? They think John is showing up. Has anybody met John Krasinski? I don't know Krasinski at all, but I but I thank him for not saying anything, and I'm waiting for his check to arrive. Um, but, you know, uh, that was amazing. That one shocked us. I mean, there are a lot of Easter eggs in there, and of course, we knew there would be so much conversation about Evan Peters showing up, and that was certainly uh, intended and done consciously. The aerospace engineer was not, and it was simply like the problem that Monica had, which was how do I get back into the hacks? And Darcy's like, you can't. But if you were going to do it, you need these things. And she and Monica being resourceful and being an astronaut and knowing how to work in horrible environments is like, huh, I know who to call, right? That's it. And she calls her friend and her friend shows up with the, the rover that she needs. And so for me, it was actually, you know, as a director, that bit of misdirection, that sort of was not intentional. And I didn't love it, to be honest, like because what's so important about that next scene is the rover the heroic moment that Monica makes to go in to follow this destiny of like, I can do this. Like just all the trappings that she had to protect her that didn't work. She knows in her heart, she can do this. And then the moment where she confront her sort of is fractured into all these pieces of herself has to deal with her grief and her loss as almost destroyed. And much like Wanda, a Phoenix rising from the ashes at the end of the finale, when she becomes a Scarlet Witch, Monica, you know, has this moment where she remakes herself. Um, and that's what was huge. I mean, I've been working for two years for that moment and for the world to be obsessed with like who's bringing the rover was a little disappointing. Oh. <laughs> like, don't be distracted or disappointed because Mr. Fantastic isn't here. What's more important is what's happening emotionally with our character's journey. So there, there are a few moments there where I, I kind of wish, you know, some things didn't go the way they went because that wasn't intended. But did we want you guys to talk about Pietro and theorize about Pietro? Yeah, of course. So some are intentional and some are, are surprises, good or bad. <laughs> so, yeah. I would like to, I would like to say, uh, uh, Jim, I know you have a question here, but I just want to say that the aerospace engineer thing, like I remember the realization of like, oh, I did kind of uh, overhype this and, and th in my own head because nobody and t nobody kind of blew this up except us. And then I was like, ah, that's a little bit disappointing. But then I looked at like Captain America, the Winter Soldier. They name the valedictorian in New Mexico, I think it was, and they and in Doctor Strange, they talk about there's a they say the woman with the electromagnetic implant and the guy who broke his spine, and there's just things like that that don't always like and and nobody hold nobody gripes over those. Captain America, the Winter Soldier <laughs> is still like widely accepted as the best Marvel movie yet. So I just I I, I had to like take a step back, and be like you know what, like just enjoy the characters here because that's what the show's about, and it ended up landing perfectly. So. Uh, I, I do. I just wanted to say. I think it's it works. Like it all it all works, and it's like hey, there's no way you could have predicted that. Hey, no, no, no. Mea culpa needed on your side, and all mea culpa on my side. But no. it's like um, 
it's you know it's funny like i think the weekly release thing is a wonderful thing but it also mm-hmm. has its ability to kind of spin in different directions and had we watched uh maybe if you had binged wanda you know all the way through six hours straight you wouldn't have that same time to speculate or even allowed yourself to speculate in that way so unlike a movie for instance you yeah. know those moments you brought up in winter soldier or whatever you know you're just watching that straight through for two hours and and left with what you're left with at the end so yeah that's the 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 plus and the and main. you guys did get the first marvel show so there had there wasn't like this was the show where any lessons that might need to be learned from how we talk about it or anything like that are going to happen like yeah. so th- this hasn't happened yet and the marvel fandom has never had this before where we look at movies and we do this stuff but there isn't something a week later that we're amplifying it every week so it's a very interesting experience jim go ahead I've got a bit of a, it's a bit of a two-part question because it happens kind of at the the same uh, moment, right? So when, uh, when Monica and Jimmy uh, kind of meet up for the, for the first time and they're outside uh, of the hex and they're talking to the, to the cops, um, you know, the, the cops say that like Westview doesn't exist and that they are from, from Eastview. Is that really just a byproduct of being potentially too close to the hex and the magic affecting that? But also too, uh, Jimmy also mentions that he is there chasing down a missing persons report. And I don't know as if that ever paid out. And so is that something that is still a question that is at large kind of thing? Or is that something that just ended up on the cutting room floor? Got it. Um, well, yes, in terms of, nobody knowing that Westview exists. Westview does exist. Right. Um, and that's why Jimmy's there, obviously. But the people in the environment around it have forgotten it, basically, okay. because Wanda has, has made it so. She's created a, a kind of black hole there so she can uh, be uninterrupted and, and people won't find their way in too much. Um, so that's what that was. And then in terms of the missing person, yeah, there there's an answer for that. And, uh, you know, hang in there. <laughs> Ooh. I'll take that. I'll take that. Ah, Listen, that's exciting. I'll, I'll wait for the. I'll wait for wherever we see Jimmy Woo again to find out, or wherever Jimmy Woo isn't, and we find out. That's like the. Now we just got to go look at the the list of thousand titles in Marvel and see where where that might happen. <laughs> but uh, the the uh, the uh, the comment section, guys. We'll talk about Evan Peters. We'll do it right now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk about it. And uh, I mean, so I mean, I I. I thought that reveal was awesome. It was a cool thing to have Evan Peters at the door there. And then obviously this leads into multiverse of madness. So we're all with rumors of Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield and Jamie Foxx and all that stuff that's out there. Evan Peters comes in and we're all like multiverse and it's a mislead. It's a very, it's a Mandarin Iron Man three twist. And I, I love Iron Man three is a great movie. That's that twist. Like by the time I let it settle in, I was like, this works really well. Uh, but I do. I am curious. It, like you guys cast him because not be just because he's Evan Peters and he's a great actor, but it was you guys looked at him and said, "Yeah, he was he was Quicksilver in a different franchise. This could work." Like that was that that had to be part of it, right? Oh yeah, for sure. It's definitely part of it. Evan Peters is a great actor, and having Evan Peters in your show, regardless of whatever else he's done is a huge boon to that show. Um, he is a brilliant comedian and a great dramatic actor, which makes him just like Katherine Hahn and Lizzie and Paul and Tiana and everybody else in the cast, one of these amazingly flexible performers who can kind of do anything. Um, so just huge boon for us to have him in the show. But we already have Wanda bringing Vision back to life, right? So the person who's at the door is not someone she's brought back to life. The person at the, the door is Agatha's attempt to poke and prod Wanda to a find out more information, but ultimately put pressure on her so that this, her fragile sort of psyche will fracture and potentially open up the ability for what ended up happening at the end of the show, where she can steal this power from her, find out what the power is, find out how it happened and then ultimately take it. Right. So, so the person at the door is not the real Pietro, no matter what, whether it had Aaron Taylor Johnson's face or Evan Peters' face, right? So that's that's the story we're telling. And that's the story we knew we were telling. So how much more fun is it that it's not exactly what you expect when the door opens, right? And it's, a, it's an exploration of grief as well, because when you're grieving and you've lost something, they talk about magical thinking, which, you know, Joan Didion wrote a great book, The Year Magical about it. she lost her husband. Um, I love the, the the play on word there with Wanda too, because it is absolutely magical thinking in her case too. She sees the person at the door who she wants to see. At first, she's not sure, right? But it's when he says, "I'm your brother," basically, like, "Yeah, it's me. Come hug me." 
She wants it so badly, which I think we all can understand for those of us who've lost someone, that she's willing to embrace that illusion. So for us, in terms of the, the overarching theme of the show, which was always about loss, how we come to terms with loss, how we grieve, um, and the stages of grieving, this really felt like it fit in with that bargaining section, you know, that's it with Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, like you're, you're, you're negotiating about your loss, you're trying to figure out a way through it, and she's willing to embrace this fake Pietro, which is not the real Pietro. And then on top of it all, for us, it was a fun meta sitcom joke. Um, you know, there have been so many recastings where people don't even comment on it. Uh, there's a new Darren. He's the same Darren, but he's a different Darren. Moving on. You know, that's a sitcom <laughs> thing. And so for us to be able to, while well, we're fully in the sitcom world there, um, you know, have Evan Peter show up and say, who's the popsicle? Cut to black. You know, and then the next episode, he's Uncle B. Um, so that, that's why we did it. And um, we always knew we were heading towards Ralph being the reveal. Um, which, by the way, does answer another question. I'm sure had we not answered, we'd be getting a million questions about who is Ralph? Right. <laughs> um, so there you go. You got Ralph, but you didn't get Quicksilver. Is Ralph an actor? Because he has a headshot. I'm curious oh, yeah. if like Ralph Boner uh, tried to make it big in Hollywood. Ralph Boner, yeah, he's, he's, he's an actor. I don't know how well it's going for him. He's got a big <laughs> stack of unused headshots. So, you know, we'll see. The, the New Jersey actor life must be, there's probably not a lot of work out there. Yeah, there. commute to New York. Commute to New York. Yeah, easy commute. Oh, that's true. That's true. That's fair. That's fair. Uh, I, I I spoke with you and I spoke with Jack earlier this week, and it sounds like you, you know there's stuff you guys added, there's stuff you guys uh, removed from the finale based on the delay. And you got, I also got time to crack it. It sounds like, but uh, one specific thing I didn't get a chance to ask was whether or not Doctor Strange was ever like actually part of an appearance or anything like that to kind of take. Scarlet Witch to his movie, essentially, or anything like that was ever part of the plan. Everything is discussed, you know, for sure. Um, there were de there were ideas along the way about how that would work, but it never fit for us. It, this was a story about Wanda dealing with her, her own problems and, and her own destiny and her own path. So the idea that Doctor Strange was going to fly in and help her that just that's not the story we were telling you know this yeah. is she has her own agency she doesn't need uh, an avenger to come fly in and help her save the day um this was her discovery um so so in the end there really wasn't a, a place for dr strange to pop in and the setup you know because i think people were looking for him because it's been clear that this leads into the next dr strange movie but i think you'll find how it leads in has been established it's just maybe not what everyone expected I remember, I think a while ago, I was at like one of these, one of the movie junkets or something, and all the journalists tend to whisper to each other the things they've heard, but they're not sure of. And I think somebody put it in my head that, like, straight, that Benedict was in the show. And for a while, I was like, it's, I don't know how he's going to fit. I mean, yeah, I want to see him. It's awesome to see Doc Strange. But then as it got closer and closer to the end, I was just like, if that turns out to be right, it's going to be weird. Does he just fly in and join the battle and then be like, come with me? I was, <laughs> but uh, so, yeah, I mean, I. It, that's kind of the thing with Marvel. We're all expecting all these characters to show up all the time because they all know each other and they were an endgame together. That's not gonna be the case. And I think that it would have been weird to have him. I would have been, I would have loved to see him, but it would have been weird to have him. You know, I think, yeah. Anyway, Jim, you do have a, was, are you, where are we at on this? Yeah, I am. I'm, I'm, changing, I'm changing my question up though, because I, it was one of the other things that uh, sent me down one of my uh, crazy theory spirals. Um, it was the, um, uh, Agatha's bunny, Senor Scratchy. And, you know, one <laughs> You've of been the... On this. You've been <laughs> <laughs> One of... One... So, it... It... Uh, I felt uh, really crazy because I, di I didn't catch it until later in the series, the, the Mr. Scratch of it all. And obviously, that led and fed into a lot of the Mephisto theories, because Mr. Scratch is, a, uh, you know, what people refer to the devil as and all that. Is that another one of those things where we just have to wait on what, who or what is Senior Scratchy? James Spader is Senior Scratchy. <laughs> <laughs> um, coming soon to Disney Plus, Senior Scratchy, his own standalone show. Um, listen, uh, Senior Scratchy is also an excellent actor. We know that he played these <laughs> um, There are a lot of things you did learn about Senior Scratchy. Um, you know, we did the set piece that that we had. Uh, originally planned for the finale, but ended up losing was a big payoff for Senior Scratchy, which is basically that 
the rabbit is Agatha's familiar. There's a, she has a cat in the, you know, in the comics that turns into a panther. Um, so we had a, we replaced that cat with a, with a bunny because it was fun. And because we had places for the bunny in the magic mm-hmm. show. And then later on, we sort of kept establishing Senor Scratchy's presence. But yeah, it's it's a it's a name that's meant to evoke the devil, Nicholas Scratch, all the you know comic book uh, <laughs> things that are involved with with good old Agatha Harkness. But it's just her name, you know. And it's just it's, uh, Senor Scratchy's name is one that Agatha has given him in honor of, of course, you know, the darker things. Um, but yeah, so the set piece in the basement was they go down to try to get the dark hold. Uh, Senor Scratchy kind of hops up in front of the book. And uh, Billy's like, oh, Senor Scratchy, he's the best, and reaches forward to try to give him a little, a little wub. And the rabbit turns into a, a demon rabbit, which we, <laughs> which we named Benicula after like a, a vampire bunny book I read when I was a kid, which is super Bye. terrifying. Um, so Benicula kind of, you know, transforms and chases them around the basement. And it was originally where we gave Billy and Tommy their sort of first big power moments. So Monica being the hero distracts the rabbit, the rabbit chases Monica, and Tommy uses his super speed to get Darcy and Ralph out of there, and he's coming back to get Monica, but just as he's about to grab Monica, the rabbit leaps, and you think, you know, Monica's done for, and then little blue hex forms around it, and there's Billy, like, holding the rabbit for the first time, using his hex power, and Tommy's able to get, you know, Monica out, come back for Billy, just as the rabbit kind of like fights its way out of the blue hex and they go out through the door and it slams and the rabbit's like, you know, trapped in there, scratching on the other side of the door. It was a really fun, it. very goony style thing. And it allowed us to have those moments with the the power sets sort of for the twins. But ultimately we found a version that was sort of exactly the same in the town square where it sort of fit much better with all of these interlocking narratives. So you still get, Billy with the little hex holding the bullet and you still get Tommy super speeding around and taking everybody's guns and, and Monica's power moment. So I, I I mean listen, you could have put you could have put literally anything on the screen and people were gonna do the Leonardo DiCaprio Mephisto. Right. Yeah, I mean, yeah. like no matter what it was, point of the TV screen, people were saying that a bunny was Mephisto, a fly, a cicada. Uh I, I was I, I'm proud to say. I was never one of the Mephisto theory champions. All I'm really... right. <laughs> All was right. I? Was I? No, I was but you were, on a, you were on a bunch of other ridiculous uh, no. theory trains. You can't get... <laughs> Couldn't be me. Not let you, and not let you get away with that one. Couldn't be me. I don't know what you're talking about. This is a great time to pull in another fan question, Richard. <laughs> Let's pull up uh, one more so question. My question for you is, how did COVID-19 affect the direction of the show? Vis-a-vis, vis-a-vis did you guys have to cast less people and did you guys intend on introducing more characters into the MCU, but couldn't because of the restrictions of COVID? It's a great question. COVID definitely affected how we made it, but didn't affect what we made. Um, we didn't hold back on introducing characters because of it. Our story was our story. We just ended up going into post-production earlier than we expected, and we didn't finish shooting until much later than we expected. But that, you know, we were all uh, dealing with a, a lot of changes. Um, everyone in the world was over the last year. It's been an amazing time. And I have to say, to be able to go back to shooting and to be around these people that I just love and admire and to have some sem- semblance of normality return was really good for my heart and soul. Um, even though we were wearing masks and face shields and uh, and all sorts of other safety protocols. Uh, it was great to be making something and doing something and not thinking about all the loss. Um, but at the same time, I think had we started in the pandemic, it would have been very hard. You know, we we had built a great relationship and trust and had a great sense of fun. And doing comedy is hard when you're acting behind a mask. So uh, the fact that we had established all these periods and looks and characters before the pandemic hit, I think helped us a great deal so that when we went back to shoot the final third of it uh, a lot had already been established and there was a lot of trust there so we were able to kind of just you know go to work yeah we have we have a daniel j mclean vo on twitch uh said i wanted a nathan fillion cameo oh because nathan fillion was on the poster in guardians of the galaxy uh did you ever consider simon williams you guys had simon williams like in the in the art room or something in a promo video and I think that I was just probably, a, yeah, that's just a fun nod to the comics, right? How that's Vision's kind of consciousness, right? 
Yeah, I mean, I'm a great character. Um, yeah, maybe maybe at some point he'll make his way into the MCU. I don't know, but I know that yeah, there was some discussion about Wonder Man appearing in one of those Guardians movies, right? And that Nathan Fillion yeah. might have been cast. I don't know. Those are all rumors. He was like that. on a poster. Mm -hmm. He was. They put his face right. on it. I don't even know if it made the cut of the movie, but James showed a showed a photo I remember way back when you guys were shooting right next to James Gunn, right? Cause he was doing suicide yeah. squad. And then right across the, like on the next sound stage, you guys had Falcon and winter soldier. Were you guys like peeking at each other's work? Like what, what did you guys ever? <laughs> yeah. I mean, every now and then, but you know, you're so busy doing your case. Something amazing would be happening over as suicide squad built some huge sets nearby. Things were blowing up big time and we would stop and be like, what are they doing? That's cool. We're doing like a 50 sitcom here and they're, blowing some crazy stuff up over there. Um, it was very, you know, a lot of crazy stuff happening on the, the Pinewood Atlanta lot. Um, and then Falcon, Falcon was more out um, in the world than on sound stages. Um, they were they were shooting at more practical locations than we were. We were a lot on stage for the sitcom stuff. So we weren't there overlapping as much as, as we might have, um, which is too bad. But every now and then I'd hear Anthony Mackie's booming voice come through. You know. <laughs> That's a pretty good Mackie. That's a pretty good Mackie. I'm not going to lie. All right. So we got to get through these fan questions because we're, we're already an hour into this. We got to let Matt go, everybody. So let's get these last couple fan questions answered. Richard, uh, let's get one more rolling here. Hey, BD. Hey, Matt. Uh, so my name is Brandon. And uh, I was wondering, uh, what was the process like uh, coming up with Wanda's look as the Scarlet Witch? Uh, in particular, her headdress, which is a uh, pretty... Uh, pretty cool and really unique take on her iconic look from the comics. I actually hate myself because I kind of asked that question earlier. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I, 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 it's a great question. I know um, I don't have much else to add to what I, yeah. what I said already. I, um, it's I actually have a, a, I have a quick follow up on that because the thing that, that uh, so, someone had pointed out online that in, in the collar of the costume, there seems to be a spot right uh, at the thing that seems to be in the shape of the mind is stop. is that is that it was that in, is that an intentional uh nod uh to to, to vision and her or her connection to the mind stone and all that or is that just a happy accident no no that's that that is meant to be sort of an inverse mind stone design there no happy accidents in the years of you know costume development um but yeah it's it's a you know they're both obviously created of the mind stone yeah. Very cool. All right. And we have one more fan question. Uh, I think this is the fifth, right, Rachel? We have one more. If we do, roll it. Hi, my name is Rachel Leishman. Uh, first, I just wanted to say thank you. Wanda is one of my favorite characters in the entire Marvel canon. And I think WandaVision did a beautiful job of exploring her grief. And so I wanted to know, from a creative standpoint, what was the hardest part of bringing that truth and honesty to her story, especially with the added uh, sitcom element? It's a good question. I mean, it's also pointing to the thing that I, I think is so special about the show and that's part of its construction before I became involved, but that I became the sort of most protective guardian of, which is that this is ultimately a story about how we deal with loss. And um, Wanda has suffered so much and she's lost all the people that she loves. and she is trying to figure out how she can come back from that trauma and if she can come back from that trauma and it's her hitting that sort of rock bottom point in her grief that she creates this hex and she willingly jumps into it so now when you go back and look hopefully at those early sitcom episodes you understand the frame a lot more and you realize that she doesn't know where she is in that first episode because she's in denial she's embracing this uh, bit of solace that she's created for herself and that these sitcom worlds are meant to evoke the feeling she felt sitting with her parents in Sokovia and watching TV together. And it's built from her memories. It's built from her loss. Um, and it's a place where she goes to try to find comfort. So uh, the sitcoms, even though I think to the early casual viewer, they're going, what is this? This Marvel? What is this? Um, this was all part of that story. It was all part of the story of how um, this amazing person with all these powers um, chooses to turn away from the real world um, and then is forced to come back and confront it and ultimately accept the reality of her loss um, and to figure out how she can move forward, which she does. She's now my favorite character in the MCU. Like Wanda right now, I mean, I mean, listen, Iron Man's gone. 
Like he was my favorite. <laughs> and after Endgame, I mean, I, I, I firmly, I think I'm telling the truth. I truly believe this when I say Wanda is my current favorite character in the MCU. Like after, after she's what always been my favorite, her. but this yeah. has elevated to an extreme <laughs> level. It is, and that was the thing too. And the, 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 the thing that I just got to say, like I, uh, you know, we we're talking about it uh, last week, but this that finale uh, made me, you know, like truly emotional uh, a number of times uh, in it, and I can't say any thing else. Uh, anything else in the MCU has made me feel that way. I have had a ton of like like Ruha moments and like just awesome moments at the MCU, but nothing has made me. And, and, and again, I think that's a testament just to the journey that we were, you were, we were able to go on on a week by week basis and having it lead all, all the way up to that. So, you know, I, you and the team just did a phenomenal job on that. And it's just, it has climbed up to the top of my list and it's a, you know, it, it I just loved it. So thank you. <laughs> Well, I, that's awesome. I'm so glad. I love her. She is the best. Uh, you know, Wanda is a hugely important character to me too. Um, but I also think, like you said, it's a it's a real testament to this new storytelling structure to be able to spend uh, close to six hours with with Wanda and with Vision and their story um, is is allows for intimacy and quiet moments and all sorts of surprise that you couldn't have in an Avengers movie where there's so much going on. But now when you have those big movies, when you go watch Captain Marvel 2, you know so much more about Monica Rambeau, right? You don't have to establish that character, get her her power. So you, you're on a, you're on a, a moving train with that character in a great way. And Doctor Strange 2, you know, when Wanda shows up there, you have a certain understanding of where she's coming from. So all of this is going to enrich the movies, which are then going to in turn enrich the shows that are coming. And it's just like having short comic runs and long comic runs. You have a chance to really dive deep or a chance to have a big moment where all these people come together and have to save the world. And I think it's going to be um, a huge opportunity. It already is for what Kevin has created and the chance to go deeper with all of these characters. And I, I think you'll find that as you watch Falcon and Winter Soldier, you're going to find new aspects of those characters and Loki and you're going to get to meet Ms. Marvel and She-Hulk and all these things are coming and it's an exciting time. It's a great way to tell stories. Yeah. It's, it's, I mean, it's, this is the best time to be a comic book fan, but I mean, this week alone, I and mean, within two weeks, we have the WandaVision finale, Zack Snyder's justice league, uh, Fa Falcon and Winter Soldier. So, I mean, I don't know what a better time to be a fan of this stuff. Why does Ralph have super speed, Agatha? Yeah, Agatha, I, that was answered in the show. Agatha gave him the enchantment on the necklace, right? That's pretty straightforward, I think. Yeah. Uh, post credit scene, was that Wondergore Mountain, can you say? Can't say. <laughs> who, sh who shot the cabin scene? That was you, but the yep. same person casually cosplaying said, what was it like speaking with Sam Raimi? I I'm cool. a huge fan of Sam. That must have been pretty cool. Oh, yeah, I'm a huge fan of Sam Raimi, too. I, we put the Oz Great and Powerful Easter egg in there to honor Sam. Uh, of course, I'm a huge fan. Uh, go Evil Dead, of course, but all the way through. I mean, I think that the, the Spider-Man movies, especially Spider-Man 2 with Doc Ock, is maybe one of my favorite um, Marvel films. And it, it creates a kind of template in a way for what the MCU has become, that blend of comedy and drama and high-stakes action. Uh Sam helped to create that. And that, and I think that that style and those films definitely have a huge impact on, on what Marvel studios is doing. Uh, but it was great to talk to him. Yeah. But we got yeah, to, I can't know, wait to see what he's notes. doing. I can't wait oh. to see what he's doing. Is Ralph Boner named Ralph Boner outside of Westview or was that a hex name? Uh, that's his name. Yeah. That's his name. That's his... <laughs> Unfortunately. Can, can can I can I ask also too that one of the the other like um, what felt like a little bit of a, a a red herring kind of character that that the us as the audience build a mythology around Dottie uh, can you can you tell us a little bit about um, one uh, I guess your reaction to uh, everyone else building uh, her story us the audience but two um, you know we. She had one of the she had one of the the coolest kind of or coolest, but like one of the most heartbreaking kind of lines, you know, in uh, in the finale. And so, was there was there more with Dottie, or was it more just a um, you know it, it, she she played the part that you guys wanted, and uh, we all blew it out of proportion. Emma was so good as Dottie. She was so it, great. It's the latter one hundred percent. I mean, I think part <laughs> of it is just that Emma brings with her the Buffy fandom, so there's there's an interest in her. Uh, because uh, she's already played a role in, in, a, in a very popular, um, well-followed show that has deep mythology. Um, but, but we cast her because she was the best person that we, that we auditioned for that part. And that part was always just, I mean, Mrs. Hart, 
Mr. Mm -hmm. Hart, um, Dr. Nielsen. There are a lot of characters who have as big a part in our world, special guest stars for that week that weren't, uh, you know, subject to the same degree of who are they really? <laughs> uh, so, you know, Dottie just, I mean, I have to say there, we didn't, we didn't fan that fire much, but mm -hmm. you guys went and ran with it. Um, she was, she was, she was the next door neighbor who had been turned into the queen bee, just like um, poor Mr. Hart was turned into the the big bad boss who needed to be pleased. And they were, they were just cast in sitcom roles by Wanda. And then I think, you know, Emma, does a brilliant job at the the in the finale of peeling back those layers and showing what it's like to be one of those people trapped in this reality and the the psychic burden that it has to be a part of Wanda's Westview and how um how deeply unsettling it is and that she can't see her daughter I mean all of that is is a huge part of the emotional journey of the finale yeah now I'm going to take our last fan question Chronica de Atlantis if you could direct a DC movie do you have a character that you think would be fun on the other side of the comic book spectrum? Oh wow! Um, you know these are these are fighting words, right? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I, my my number one favorite uh, comic book character as a kid was Spidey, but my number two was Batman. So you know, okay. there you go. Well, John Watts is doing Fantastic Four, so when Spider Man Four rolls around, you just write him a letter and say or in the group chat you got you the tip you got, you got it in the group chat well, listen we gotta we gotta let you go just please confirm for us before you go hayward's a straight up villain right kid shot dude shot at kids well you know listen i'm not going to be a hayward apologist here uh, <laughs> that's that's dangerous territory but uh yeah he straight up shot at some kids but in his mind those kids weren't real right so. uh, i guess that's a good point it's still kind of messed up <laughs> <laughs> not kind of messed up very yeah, messed up <laughs> listen uh, honestly about we could i could do this all day but i can't keep you all day so thank you so much and congratulations on the show uh on wandavision it it was just a, it, to get back to marvel was just a treat because we went so long without it to get back in this fashion in like a show that was just so fantastic and opened so many doors for the mcu and theories and the community that we've been able to build out of your work and just on Twitter and on this show. Uh, it's been, it's been really, really fun. So congratulations and thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you guys. It's been a pleasure. And uh, anytime you want to come back, you're welcome. <laughs> thank you very much. Awesome. I look Sounds forward good. to your Spider-Man 4. <laughs> Later, yes. man. Thank you. All right. Thank, thank you. Very much. you. Bye. Bye. All right, guys. So stick around everybody in the comments. We're about to talk about the Falcon and the winter soldier. Uh, and the reactions. Jamie hasn't seen it. Jim and I have. I just want to make sure that uh, Matt popped out of here and he's not. He knows he can go. Uh, Richard, if you can drop a comment for me real quick, just let me know, like, or just let him know uh, he can. He can hop out. He doesn't have to sit and listen to us. But that was. I mean, it's. I hope we can do more stuff like that. I want to be able to work in some some fans uh, and to get some more questions answered, maybe get some live viewers, some more fan submissions. I love doing that stuff. That's what I said on the first episode of the show. I want to get you guys in here. If I see one more save quicks over, I'm going to riot. Man, but, look, uh, I just I just love that he he took every question, right? And I mean, like, listen, was... he took every question. And what are, yeah. I, I, listen, I, we've been, he, he listens, he reads the stuff. He like, what, I, the my only two gripes were the aerospace engineer, which I have gotten over. <laughs> it did not affect my opinion of the show and the Quicksilver thing. I didn't like that it was multiverse bait. And, I, you know, I'm sure he knows that. I don't have to sit here and say to Matt Shackman, man, I hate that you did that because I don't hate that he did that. I, I'm, that's, my, that's my only remaining gripe with the show. And it does not hinder my experience on WandaVision overall. So. I really like their explanation too, because when I, I interviewed Mary, the producer, the other day, and she said a similar thing about um, the grief fog and how you see people differently. And um, I don't know. I think that's a fun explanation. I too wish that it was multiverse, but he did say that we're that the witness might come back. So I'm holding out hope that Ralph mm -hmm. Boner that was big, yeah. The witness. Um, I'm gonna I'm sticking to that until it's confirmed to be not the case. <laughs> <laughs> yeah listen i mean we got like people in the comments saying those were softball questions whatever you want to call them i don't know what like we asked him for we asked him every question we could think of i don't know what you're looking yeah. for like I, what did you want us to sit here and criticize the show i don't have that many criticisms of the show to be honest i have more criticisms of the falcon and the winter soldier and i've only seen one episode 
And I and I enjoyed the Falcon and the Winter Soldier, but I, I just thought it wasn't as good as the first few episodes of WandaVision. But anyway, that's what we're about to talk about. This will be spoiler free. If you're watching us on Twitch, make sure you follow the okay. channel because this is uh, Falcon and Winter Soldier reactions. Uh, so Falcon and Winter Soldier, Jim, I'll go first. I mm -hmm. watched it last night. I've only watched it once. I haven't had time to watch it again. Um, I liked it. I didn't love it. I thought it was, it starts with a really cool action sequence and then it goes into a very deep character dive, which is very cool. Uh, it just, it does it in a way that just feels off pace, I guess is what is why I felt like I wasn't super engaged, but there are, I'm trying to be very careful with my words because I don't want to give anything at all away. There are moments, there are really cool moments and plot twists within the character development. Yep. That's all I'll say. And that was awesome. And there are also really, really cool uh, ties to the MCU in the post-Endgame era of the MCU, which are very subtle world-building moments that establish, re-establish, and start new kind of things about this world. And uh, I really liked that. Overall, I thought it was just paced kind of oddly. And I like I can't really say my one thing that I wanted, because I feel like I'll be giving something away if I do. Uh, yeah. But it has to do with both the Falcon and Bucky and where they are. Jim, does that make sense to you? Yeah, no, absolutely. And I, I think that's that's a lot of my same my same sentiments. Uh, I think this look, this show is already setting up to be an exploration of these two characters in a way that I feel WandaVision did for Wanda and Vision. But this mm -hmm. is a very different show than WandaVision. And I don't, um, it almost seems like a hard right turn kind of coming off one of and I, and I don't know what, like how else you you do this right but the fact that it's coming so close uh to one division that I, I don't know if they're you know if i've got recency bias or or whatnot the action in this show is is uh is fantastic so good. The, the first like i said that opening sequence is uh some uh, some of the most adrenaline pumping uh mcu action that i think you know we uh, we will get in the mcu uh and then from the you know from there there are a lot of great moments in the show it just feels like they happen at very strange times oh it's only the first episode a ton of you know there's a ton of room to go i think look i think you know not everyone was super hot on the first couple episodes of, of WandaVision. But once we let- I have a question about that. Go ahead. Um, because WandaVision feels like it was meant to be TV. It's an homage to television. It wouldn't have made sense uh, not being week to week. Do you think Falcon and the Winter Soldier w is more of a movie and, and sh it is more of a bingeable type of a show? Do you think that that's why the first episode maybe didn't totally work for you? Because uh, it, no, it's, I, it's a piece? It feels like, I mean, it feels like 24 to me in a way um in in that kind of uh like just action adventure e kind of show there's 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 stakes and, th and this first episode doesn't necessarily feel like there's there's not necessarily that that you know countdown that 24 has right but like there's um there's definitely it's a much more grounded show it feels it feels episodic um and and i think like you know it, what it gives you at the end. You know what it gives you at the end is, uh, you know what you would expect from from episodic television. So it does not feel like a movie cut up into episodes. It does feel made for television. Okay. I felt I, I felt like uh, I feel kind of different than the than you on that, Jim. I feel like this one would the story of it all because because I mean, WandaVision did something similar where it doesn't um, give you all of the information about who's a villain, what the purpose of the show is right out of the gate. And this show, it gives you, I think it does a, even maybe a little bit more of a job. It does a little, it's a little bit more clear of what the purpose of the show is going to be overall yes. in terms of like a villain, a mission, that sort of thing. It's still pretty unclear, but, uh, uh, I do think this is going to be just a look at the characters with a, a mission is kind of the ancillary part of it. And I, I think it's just going to be a Bucky and Falk and Sam, show and i i think that's gonna be really cool i i yeah. i think maybe my like i liked it now this is, i have to say this every time because i feel like i have to say this whenever i'm not saying something's a 10 out of 10 or it's my favorite thing ever doesn't mean i, I hated it like i liked the show i can't like give it a number rating i'm not allowed to do that yet I, like we're not allowed to officially review something but i thought it was good i just I, i'm not yeah. as high on it as wandavision yet and that's maybe because i saw the full wandavision story i know what the first episodes meant and I think I, I think people are going to dig it. I think Anthony yeah. Mackie does a tremendous job. I think Sebastian dude, Stan does dude, a really good and, job. I said this before. Anthony Mackie freaking drips charisma, and and uh, Sebastian Stan is like they're 
it's almost perfect casting for, for these characters. And that's yeah. right. And I love that these guys have made it, made these characters kind of their own with their own kind of quirks and it just works. And so I I'm excited to see more of them together um, because it just, it's, it's that type of stuff that I have faith as the show goes on, we're going to love even more. I agree. I agree. I mean, that's pretty much all we can say for now. Basically, uh, It's a good show. I think I think a lot of people are going to like it a lot and some people are going to feel kind of like that's like I want the next episode to understand more. Is that it? But yeah. we felt that way with WandaVision and it paid sure off did. tremendously. So I, I, I thought maybe the first episodes of WandaVision, maybe I just liked them more because of how purely entertaining they were in the sense they were so different. Whereas this does feel uh, a bit more incomplete, you yeah. know, because it is I, not so different and it is very much part of a story. Whereas WandaVision at least, uh, well, did, and that's the thing. I, I remember just a lot of casual fans not necessarily understanding the first couple episodes of WandaVision. We did because we're all, you know, MCU mm-hmm. nerds. But right. Falcon Winter Soldier is, I don't think, will have that problem for the more casual fans. Yeah. I think and you, all know of exactly this said, what, you know exactly what you're getting oh, uh, yeah. when you watch this. All of this said, as soon as we hang up here, I'm going to eat my lunch while watching the episode again. So yeah. it's it's obviously not bad. I like all it. Right. Uh, rub, rub it in, BD. <laughs> Listen, yeah. Who was who's coming over? Who's coming over to my house? Nody gang party. We're watching the uh, watch Falcon Winter Soldier episode one. Listen, that's all I got. Uh, Jamie, if you have any, I know you haven't watched it. So if you have any questions for us, I'm happy to answer them. I don't know. I feel like we shouldn't even say too much. Yeah, no, I, I I feel like I my one question was answered. Um, I'll get I get it a little early, but just not as early as you. So I'll be in the same braggy boat on Tuesday. Which I, get to watch it. <laughs> I do have. I am talking to the cast tomorrow. I'm talking to the director tomorrow. So if anybody in the comment section wants to get your questions answered, feel free to send them my way on Twitter or on Instagram. Uh, you know I love to do that for you. Uh, unless you're trying to ask me to ask rude questions, in which case your comment gets deleted. So thank you for everybody uh, who watched today's show. I mean, listen, the fact that we had Matt Jackman on here, this is still just the beginning for Phase Zero. I can't wait to see what we're able to do with the Falcon and the Winter Soldier and then Loki and beyond. I really am excited to get the fans involved, to be able to bring five questions from our viewers and have them play for the director I love being able to do that and I want to be able to do more of that and make it even more engaging and involved. So we still got to figure it out. That's on me. Uh, but yeah. And, and look, if anything, watch the episode of assembled today, if not for just seeing uh vision with ears. Okay. <laughs> That's that is uh, that. And, and, then the, too. The, and the realization that they gave uh, Paul Bettany a fake butt. Yes. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> so listen, well, oh, go ahead. I was saying my favorite. My, I just wanted my favorite part of the whole documentary is is Elizabeth Olsen building to wanting to wear the classic costume. Where she said that if she would have had to do that mm-hmm. seven years ago, she would have hated it. And she said that she's grown to love the fandom and love the comics. And it was so nice to hear her her say that. I, I that was my favorite part. There's so a, yeah, watch a, it. <laughs> there, I do want to know. People are still talking about Falcon Winter Soldier. There is a uh, like a full review embargo. And I'm going to watch it again and I'll be able to better articulate because I'm also just kind of dancing around. I don't know like how much we're allowed to say or whatever, like to, be, to respect the fact that these are immediate reactions and not technically reviews. My immediate reaction is it's good. I, I enjoyed it. Uh, it wasn't what I expected. And I'm, I want to watch it again and see where it goes. When I'm able to watch it again, at the first episode again, and share more words and like all that, I will... Uh, I, will prob- I promise I'll have a better articulated uh, take on it. It's, it's a good show so far. Uh, that's it for that's it for today's show. Jim, you got anything else? Um, I don't think so. Okay, Jamie, anything else from you today? No, um, I'm trying to take a, tw- a Twitter break. So I love when you guys send like clips of us and stuff. So if I don't respond, you should send them on Instagram because I'm looking at Instagram. Because <laughs> <not on Twitter. laughs> I really I'm... love those commentaries, but I'm really trying to not look at Twitter these days I, just for my I was sanity. wondering why you look so bright and up and, and, and just purely happy today. It, oh my it's, gosh. It's because I'm not on Twitter. <sighs> It's been Agatha all along. That's Twitter's theme song. So there it is. That's it. That's it. We said it. We did it. Uh, it. it. Not what I expected in a good way or a bad way. Really, not either. Like I, it's just, it, it's certainly not a bad way. Uh, I just need to watch it again. I think I just watched it late at night on a busy week. I've interviewed fourteen people this week, and I was preparing for today's interview when I watched the Falcon and the Winter Soldier. 
And now, you know, a lot of stuff going on. But anyway, listen, Jamie, thank you so much. Jim, thank you so much. Today was great. I appreciate y'all doing this interview with me. Can't thank Matt Shackman enough for joining us on Phase Zero. Everybody who's watching right now, subscribe to the Twitch channel. Hit that follow button. Uh, If you're listening to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere that we are available, please share us with your friends. The more people who listen, the better, uh, the more fun you guys are in the comment section, the more likely it is that we're able to get more guests to get you all interacting with them uh, and bring some fun content together and just get questions answered and have a good time with it. So that's all. I'm done rambling. I'm BD. Hit me up at Brandon Davis BD on any social media platforms and follow comicbook.com for more updates. Peace out.